My name is Harry Green. I'm a gamekeeper. It's not a job. It's more of a way of life. Every working day begins at first light. The first thing I hear is my own drawn chorus as the pheasants start to come down from the trees where they roost. You can hear them from miles away. It's a reminder there's work to be done. If you looked on it as just a job, an eight to four job, you'd never make a keeper. It's gotta be, you've gotta feel keeper and it's, it's in you, it's part of you. I've never thought of it as I'm man the hunter, it's just something that I do. It's certainly in me. It's certainly in all the people I hang around with. It's a perfectly natural urge to go out hunting. A special time of day this is. It's quiet, stowed about. It's my own this is. I get a feral buzz out listening to these old birds come down off the roost. See what you've done through the summer. You know, all them birds, there's a lot of work coming down off them trees. All the hours I've put in. Uh, my grandfather was a keeper. Um, I was out with my grandfather on an Estador estate where my father farmed for a long, long time. And it was just accepted that when I left school, I would take over his position. And when he died, I took on as a single handed position and was there for a number of years. Cheers, old mate. Straight in during the camp. The estate I work on is. We own two and a half thousand acres of mixed farming and mixed woodland, and we also rent the shooting rights from a thousand acres of Forestry Commission. I was dropped in here at the deep end. I was dropped, I moved here. I was given the map of a place which you can make head or tail of. Map off a photocopier, which wasn't that correct either. Uh, so I was just left my own devices, and I got raking rains talking to people. But to actually know the place really well takes your fella at least a 12 month. I now know that I know every tree on the estate, I know my way right round. I go anywhere blindfolded and know where I am. From the day I have the birds, I whistle to them, all right? And they associate that whistle with food and with me. And really, I'm like a broody end to them. That's what they think of me as. They're taking some calling in because there's so much beach and that's an acorn that they're on at the moment. They're hungry. They're not hungry, rather. They're out there feeding on the wild stuff. Listen to that at all. I like it worse than this. You get a good hard morning, you'll have this absolutely plastered with birds in here. And I call them up here because this is where I want them for a shoot day, actually in this wood. Get them all here together. Good old wood, too. Lee came to me when he was still quite young, by about seven, no, about 14 he was. He's not what I'd call an early morning boy. Um, and he needs operation to get that pipe from between his legs occasionally. His, his idea of exercising his dogs is to let the dogs chase after him across the field. Lee looks after the inside woods on the estate. I look on, look after all the outside, the farthest woods. I do most of the traveling. Why we're feeding the pheasants is because there's not enough natural grub for the numbers of birds that we're releasing. The reason you feed early in the morning is to catch the birds when they come off route. So like yourself, when you get up in the morning, you're a bit hungry, you want some breakfast. So we get there then to catch the birds. We feed three times a day anyway, at the early part of the season. The amount of grub you feed is, would work at about 100 weight per day per 1,000 pheasants. Pheasants are put there to shoot. Same as fir trees are grown to be cut down. You want to leave a surplus stock of birds so that you've got a backup and it's nice to have pheasants in the place. But you wouldn't want to put out the thousands of pheasants and then leave them and not shoot them. It would be a pointless exercise. The estate is situated just outside of Dawlish and it's made up of three valleys 
they run parallel with each other towards the sea. It's very high ground. People don't expect there to be quite such high ground in South Devon as we've got here. It's very steep, banky ground. Very difficult to farm. There would be no money made out of the woodlands without the shooting. The woodlands would just be let go, because at the moment the woods are maintained for our pheasants. And what comes out of the woods is a cash crop, as are the pheasants that come out of the woods. They're a cash crop. Major Rayner's the, the estate owner, and I'm answerable to him. I see him once a week, time allowing. Morning, Major. Oh, good morning, Howard. Yeah, I'm glad you called in, in fact. Um, we have got a problem. And that I'm respectful of the Major, but I wouldn't talk to him any differently than I would to you. I'm honest with the Major all the time. I let him know exactly what I'm feeling, and I think he likes that. I have the run of the estate, as far as the game is concerned. I, I do the whole lot, he, and he doesn't question what I do. As long as I've got my results at the end of the year, he's happy and lets me carry on with the job. We uh, came to Ashcombe as a family in 1934, when my father bought the estate. Um, and after that, uh, well, I started shooting the moment I could handle a gun. Of course, the, uh, there was a slight hiccup. Uh, one day I was shooting rabbits, and I came in at breakfast time with my gun, and I inadvertently let it off under my mother's chair as I was uncocking it. And of course, the problem was that my father took my gun away for almost two years. Shooting is very important to, to an estate like this, uh, and that in turn pays for the keeper, and he in turn looks after the countryside. Uh, he's really involved not only in rearing pheasants um, and producing them over the guns, but his other jobs entail liaising with the farmers and the villagers. And also, of course, he keeps down the vermin, which helps at lambing time. Uh, the farmers are very grateful for that. And, of course, he's my eyes and ears in the countryside. All the kale you see on the place is grown especially for the shoot, extra cover for the pheasants. We pay the farmers to grow it all, and we have it for the pheasant shooting until the end of the season, end of January. And after that, they graze it off. What we like to do, if we can, is feed birds out of the main wood to kale for the morning, and then shoot them back to the main wood. We got shot here last year, driving this one. We drove the wood down through here, the majority of the birds got here are pretty good eyed birds. But one went out across here. He was only skimming that high. A bloke out there shot straight into the wood. Missed us the first shot. I shouted at him <coughs> to keep his gun up. Another bird went out. Whoosh, straight in here. Got me up the side of the aid. So I shouted at him. <laughs> Lost the temper a bit, little bit. Stopped the drive. Stopped the drive. Pulled the beaters out. They wouldn't have stayed near anyway. I wouldn't have blamed him for walking home. I went out to have a word with this chap, and he kept running away from me, so he had to have a bit of it. Quiet here. Fox or a dog has been up through here, something, something stirred him right up. Nothing here, look. Well, when this track on a shoot day, eh? you'd be embarrassing to come here and like this. Fox I bet. We kill as many as we want, they still keep coming in here anyway. Same as these magpies and carrying crows. We kill in the region of three, four hundred magpies each spring. By the end of the summer they've all come back in from outside. No, Fox getting amongst these tame birds, he play hell with you. Clear you right out. I've lost over two hundred in the night before now. The fox getting a release pen. It's a bit disheartening then, go there in the morning, see that lot there, Dave with their heads just took off. There you are. Hello, it's Eric Green here, Rainer's Keeper at Ashcombe. I've just finally let you know that we're going to be out lamping foxes tonight at Ashcombe and through Luton and Idford. Yeah, between roughly 8 and 10 at the latest. I just, you know, I'm letting you know so that you don't get any 
phone calls, people think it's the other crowd after the deer. Okay, thanks a lot. Lamping is one of the easier forms of fox control. Um, by using a vehicle, we cover a lot of acreage. We can, we can do the whole estate at night time. Without having to actually go on a lot of fields, we can do it off the roadsides. We always have to inform the police that we're going out. The lamp basically is driving rain, running a floodlight off the back of the truck till you see the fox. And then he may sit still in the lamp for you to have a shot at him. You may be lucky you'd be in range. Otherwise, we try and call a fox in, which is make a noise like a distressed rabbit or a cub, a fox cub. Get the fox to run up the lamp beam towards you till he's in range of the rifle or shotgun, whatever you're using. <laughs> Why is he called Charlie? Uh, he's Charles Reynard, um, but he's known affectionately as Charlie. I like foxes. I spend an awful lot of my time doing my best to get rid of them, but I wouldn't want to see the last fox gone from here. He's a nice animal to watch. He's a very clever animal. He's adapted well. We get a lot of fun out of chasing foxes, of controlling foxes. Like I said, I wouldn't want to see the last fox gone from here. Every Saturday from April to the time we start pheasant shooting, we go out fox driving. Uh, primarily early in the spring, we're looking for cubs, litters of cubs, which we dig out with the terriers. What I do, though, uh, we surround the cover with a team of guns. They're all good chosen Sir, blokes. They're all, they're all safe shots. Good chaps, you know what they're up to. I go in with the dogs and the hound and the terriers and draw through. I use my horn to control the hound and the terriers. If they respond, I can send them on, pull them back, make them draw, let them go here and go there. One of two things will happen. He'll either go out and face the guns and the lurchers, and hopefully he'll be shot or he'll be caused by a lurcher and pulled down and killed quickly. Or there's a fair chance he'll go to ground, in which case I'll go in with a terrier, dig him out and shoot him. There's some earth in here. Let the terriers try the earth first. Ooh. Very hard cover here, man. They don't like this cover very much. Get on, dude. Arrow to come in from the top. It'll bring the far side down. Then come towards us. Hopefully, you should push it this way or to the bottom. It might go back on him, but the chances are you push it forward. There's my terrier been through. I haven't seen it since I put in. Has my terrier been through? I haven't seen him since I put in. Bill. He's there, is he? This is the hill line they brought back, Bill. Hey. This is the hill line they've come back on. Well, I went one or the other out. He might have been there. Uh, well, I was well, two yards back when you blew first, but he might have been there something before they did escape. I don't know, I don't know, but uh, not since you started driving proper yet and come out there. That's the definition. Do you hear what he said? There's been one through, there's definitely been one through here. The terrier just brought a line back through. See where my hand is? There's a line down through there. Lines of scent. But, he might not be in here. I don't know if it is a different way of life because I've never lived in the town, but it's something we were always brought up at home on a farm. We, father used to give us calves to rear, and then when they was old enough, they were sent to market or the throats cut. So, same with lambs and whatever. What's you know? Why have any particular feelings about it? You got an old dog, 
that you think the world of, been with you a long time, when his end comes, will you do the kind of thing you shoot him or have him put down? Where one death finishes, another life starts again. I, I don't think there's any point in getting emotional about it. Them birds or whatever it is we're, that's having it, at the end of the day, he's had a good life. And we do our best to ensure that when it's killed, it's killed quickly and cleanly. And it's killed for a reason. We never kill anything just for the sake of killing it. The pressure is right on now. This is the end, this time of year is the end result of a year's work. And we've got it all approved now. We've got to hope that the birds are here, make sure we get our bags right through the season. We drive the pheasants back to stop them crossing the boundaries and make sure that they're in the centre of the estate all the time. We use the dogs to save ourselves a lot of legwork. On foot, when we're, yeah, when birds are really going, we'll do nine or ten miles comfortably in a day. And the dogs will do more mileage than that. The dogs will do three or four times more than that because they're quartering, they're coming back and forth to all the time. They're on the go the whole time. Good boy. And in a straight line somewhere. Good dog. Get on, son. Get on. Good boy. Gator, gator, right? Oh, well, I've spent the day feeding the birds, checking where they are, putting the gun pegs out, which is the positions where the guns will stand on each bit of cover or drive that we do. It's a nice time of year. I, I look forward to the start of the shooting season with relief. You know, it's nice to start knowing that your numbers of birds are going to start dwindling now. You ain't going to have to hunt so much grub about. And hopefully by Christmas you won't have to spend so much time sat up the wood at night waiting for Charlie to come along, take the birds or a poach or take the birds. Beaters, I don't want no shouting this year. Just tap them sticks in the line, all right? If I'm not about, Lee is the underkeeper. So you will listen to him, OK? OK, morning, chaps. How are you all doing? Um, today, as you know, is going to be the first one of the season. So pick your birds well, make sure you're picking decent birds that you're going for. Um, now the drive will be started by Master Ray firing a shot and it will be concluded by you'll hear the key keeper blow a whistle, at which point all out. <laughs> We're just taking this down to that kale, all right? Here, here. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Howard's job is to really raise and produce high-flying, difficult pheasants. And that's what shooting in Devonshire is about. That is why people come from all over the world to shoot in Devonshire. And then he will make quite sure that the guns are positioned in the right place. Howard's lucky because he has a wife who helps do this. Um, and then he will make absolutely certain that the, all the beaters are there Chris, um, and all the pickers right up are in position. Bit. Everything is done uh, with military precision. Oh, right, get this line sorted, look. You're on the bloody telly. They all get in line. Keep You're excited. It about. Look, anticipation of a day's shooting on, is back. exciting. But it also stresses you right out when things start going wrong. I may scream and bawl at one or two of them. They've grown used to it now. They take no notice. They know it's, it's tension. George. As the season progresses and everything starts running smoothly again, won't be no problem. Charge! We've got some cover crop, which is kale, and it's above and to the side of the main wood. And the objective is to get the birds to fly from the kale back to the penwood, which is behind us over here. Um, and consequently, you've got the guns in between that, and you're hoping that they're going to fly nice and high and the guns get the chance to shoot, pick some really good birds and shoot them. It's great fun because it's a great day out in the country with lots of friends that come and you sort of have the same group each year so you get to know everyone very well. 
and it's a challenge and it's a good sport against the birds. Obviously, the high birds make the best birds, so you don't go for the low ones, and they have a good sporting chance. And so, so you don't actually kill that many, but it's great fun. Yeah, flat going, Lee. The perfect drive for on a high bird shoot is you're showing the pheasants at the highest maximum point that they can be shot at. And if you can do that all day on every wood you've got, you've achieved it. It's a challenge for a gun to shoot a 50 or 60 yard up bird. People say those birds are at range. They're not at a range. They're killable. And if a gentleman's coming here often enough shooting, or, or spending enough money on his shooting, he should be able to cope with those birds like a batsman playing cricket should be able to deal with a fast bowler. All right, gentlemen! Well done, Lee. What about the romance of the job? People associate the gamekeeper with D.H. Lawrence. Yeah, with Lady Chatterley's lover. There's nothing like that at all. I mean, it's very hard work. It's not a nine to five job. It's uh, a dawn till dusk. And I mean, if we're lucky, uh, we manage to get a holiday sometime in February, March. Uh, you know, lovely weather, super great, you know. But uh, most of the time, if I want to go anywhere on some holiday, I go on my own. Because in the summertime, he's got stock to look after and he can't leave it. So there's no chance for romance? Well, there is. There's the, you know, the, the countryside is the romance, if you see what I mean. You have, to have, you have to have an affinity for the countryside, but, you know, there's no sort of uh, the, the scenes of passion in... <laughs> he's far too knackered, really. <laughs> and we'll put one over She's involved with keeping because I'm a gamekeeper. She hasn't got no choice. She has it fed down her all the time. When you're in this game, that's all you live, eat and breathe is gamekeeping. We talk about nothing but foxes and pheasants. People think we're very in small-minded people, but that's, that's how we are, that's our interest. She could either take an interest and be involved or not take an interest and hardly ever see me. All sorts of people shoot. We get businessmen come here to shoot. We get a lot of foreigners come here to shoot. We get lords and ladies come here to shoot. We get scrap dealers come here and shoot, shopkeepers. People from all walks of life shoot, provided they can afford it. It is expensive. But so is horse racing. So is rally driving. Most sports are expensive. Putting it to show these high birds, you've got to charge your money because you don't get such a return as you do on a low bird shoot. I'm pleased. Don't worry. They could have shot a lot more than they have. They weren't bad. Oh, beaters need shaping, shaping up a bit, but it's first time like for against each other since in January. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, really pleased, well pleased. Better never go home. Well, we always go and have a rip round at night, just before dark, watch the birds going at the roost. And then at some point in the night, one or the other of us, or both of us, will be out together, checking around, looking for poachers. We spend an awful lot of time up in the woods at night, and it's not a lot of fun. And nobody thinks any more of you for being up there. But if we weren't up there, we wouldn't have peace of mind when we were sat in here watching telly, or you probably wouldn't sleep too good at night. You don't catch everybody, a lot of people get away with it, but there's always somebody out to have something for nothing. So we spend a lot of time ripping around in the woods at night, walking around. All sorts of things give it away that there's somebody about. What does Ara Green get a gamekeeper in the Fulfillment, I get a lot of fulfillment out of keepering. Um, you see your end product in that game larder at the end of each day's shooting. People come and thank you for looking after them on a the day. Little things that other people would probably never see. Get out early in the morning, hear them birds starting off in the morning, you know, the dawn chorus. Seeing air raking around in the field in the dew. Watching deer. All jobs like that. Things. Things we see, nobody else knows what's going on. They haven't got a clue. They read about it, but they've never seen it themselves. The people we talk to, they've never seen a badger. We see badgers as a common thing every night. It's quite a nice thing to sit down and watch old badger playing about. That's what I get out of keeping. <laughs>